Amen. Thank you so much. Uh, to Mr. Mark, before we consider today's scripture reading and today's message, I want to thank the band for leading us in worship. I want to thank all the volunteers who set up the altar. I want to thank the people who are running the cameras and the computers and the boards and keeping us connected in worship. All the volunteers who are talking online, saying hello to all of our guests and visitors. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your role in worship today. Hello everyone, my name is Lance Marshall. I'm one of the pastors here at the First United Methodist Church in Fort Worth. And I want to start today uh, with a bit of an archaeology uh, revelation. I specifically want to share something with people who are under 30. You may not have ever seen one of these before, and so I want to share. If I can get a close-up right here on camera four, if you'll give me a zoom up, I want to share something with you. This is something you may have never seen before. Uh, can you see it very clearly on the camera there? Can you see this? This is an amazing piece of technology for those of you who are not familiar. Uh, it's called the Razor, the Motorola Razor, and you need to know that this was the most important thing in the entire world between the years of 2003 and 2008. It's a cell phone, and it was the absolute epitome of cell phone technology during that window. And looking back, it's, it's, run, it's really kind of fashionable still. It still fits great in the pocket. The battery life lasts forever. It's great at making and taking phone calls. It's not so great at uh, sending text messages, though you can. Those of us who are still speed demons at T9 predictive text know what I'm talking about. But that's about all that it does. And so while it does take excellent one megapixel pictures and why it can technically uh, make phone calls and it can receive texts, it's hard to get addicted to. It is. And then the world changed in January of 2007. And in January of 2007, there was a new product release. It was called the Apple iPhone. You've probably never heard of it. I'm really into technology. You may not have heard of it, but the Apple iPhone was a unique piece of technology because two different things had converged at the same time. One was our cell phone data networks had become robust enough where they could send a lot more over the air in our radio signals than just basic voice calls or uh, small bits of text. They could send massive amounts of data over the air, really unlock what you could do with a mobile device. And two, computing power had risen up to the point where something that could fit in your pocket could be powered for hours and could run apps, could uh, could run programs, could communicate via GPS, could do all sorts of things. Those two things converged and the world changed. The world changed, didn't it? I don't know how long it's been uh, since you first got a smartphone. Maybe you were an early adapter right there in 2007, one of the first ones to jump on. Uh, maybe you're one of the people who took a little bit longer when it's time for you to upgrade. You finally made that leap. I'm going to guess that most of us now are pretty well solidified in the cell phone world and specifically smartphones. I mean, they're more than just phones now, right? I mean, what percentage of the time that it's in your hand are you using it to communicate verbally with someone? Not a whole lot. The fact that we even call them phones is kind of a relic anymore. There's so much more than that. So these incredible devices that can do incredible things, that can serve us in incredible ways, that can be an incredible blessing to us over and over and over again, up to a point, up to a point. Uh, this Motorola Razor that I own, um, I, it's not from 2003. Uh, it's not from 2008. Uh, it's actually from uh, 2012. I bought it in 2012 because I have these two uh, habits that I just, I just can't seem to break, and that is about every two years, I will get so flummoxed by the overwhelmingness of the phone and its addictive properties and social media and how much they suck you in that I will quit all my social media platforms. I will take the SIM card out of my cell phone and I will put it into a dumb phone and I will just disconnect for some period of months from all of those things. I'll just, I'll just need a break. Um, I asked my wife, how would you describe uh, being my partner when I do that? And she said, it is the thing about you that frustrates me the most, <laughs> she said. She said, it is so inconvenient when you're not using your smartphone. She's like, you can't get text right. You can't be on group text. She's like, you'll get lost and not have a GPS. You'll have to print out directions when you're going somewhere. She hates it, and she's right. It's, it's incredibly inconvenient because the phone's just so convenient. But yet, sometimes I feel this overwhelming pressure to get away from it. And I want to talk about why that is. So here at First United Methodist Church and in the gathering worship services, everything that we do is about helping you grow spiritually, helping you grow in your connection to God, helping your eternal soul become more attuned to who you've always been meant to be. Sometimes that involves us taking some pretty drastic steps in our lives. Sometimes it involves us doing things differently, right? 
for our own well-being, for our own growth, our own spiritual maturation. If you're someone who the idea of maturing spiritually doesn't make any sense to you, what it means is basically you becoming the person you've always been meant to be. And it has everything to do with who you are, how you see life, how you see God, and how you see other people. That's what spiritual growth is all about, and sometimes spiritual growth requires some specific steps. And we're going to be talking about three specific steps over the next three weeks. This is week one. As Clint mentioned, this week's put down your phone. Yeah, I don't know how much time you spend on your phone. This week, it needs to be less. It needs to be less. And I want to make it very clear, I am not talking about two things. One, I am not talking exclusively about social media. Right? I'm talking about the whole kit and caboodle. I'm talking about text messages. I'm talking about alerts from news apps. I'm talking about everything that fits into that little box, that little rock that we shot full of lightning and taught how to think. All right? It's not just about social media. And two, I'm not just talking about young people. Okay? I'm not just talking about younger generations. I'm talking about everybody. This includes you. We need to talk about our phones and specifically using them less, acknowledging the ways in which they impede our spiritual growth because, y'all, they are addicting. They are addicting psychologically. They're addicting physiologically. And they're even addicting spiritually. That's what I want to talk about today. The psychological addictions of our phones run really deep. I mean, psychologically, the research is overwhelming that we have these needs for connection, We have these needs for feeling like we're not missing out. And particularly a time like this where it's so hard to get connection, it's so hard to not feel like you're missing out, those phones become a lifeline, right, for helping us feel like we're connected even though we know that connection is not real. Psychologically, we also have a deep need for affirmation. We have a deep need for feeling like we're on the right track, and that involves both asking people to affirm us, maybe that's through things like likes or text messages, it's also through comparing ourselves to others. How much of our social media and phone time is used for that, right? Consciously or subconsciously. And I bring up subconsciously because one of the things that you need to know about your phone, all of your phone, not just your text message, not just your social media, is it's deeply addicting physiologically, like to your body and to your brain. Do you realize that? I was listening to a podcast once and was talking about all the scientific research that had gone into the formation of slot machines. So I'm not really in the gambling. I don't know much about it, but what I do know is that slot machines are the worst odds that you have at the casino. There's no skill involved. You're literally just putting money in a machine and pulling an arm. And millions and millions of dollars of research have been put by casinos and the manufacturers of the slot machines how to keep you sitting there losing money for as long as possible. And they made realizations. They made, they realized that the more chimes and bings that the machine made, the more that it made your brain pay attention. They realized that the more colorful it was, the more deeply engaging it was, the longer that you could look at it and stare at it. Colorful chimes and beings. They realized that they had little alerts pop up, that your brain would start be looking for more alerts. It would stay connected longer because your brain is searching for more. And they realized that the more random the rewards were that would come out of it in a slot machine, money, that the more deeply attuned you would get, the more fixated you would be on it. That psychologically, physiologically, the very grooves of your brain would become addicted to this dispenser of bright lights, beings, and rewards. Do you realize that all of that science has been used by cell phone and app manufacturers to design what you're holding in your pocket, or let's be honest, your hand right now? The design of the endless scroll the design of the red alert buttons and the red alert notifications, the pings, the app notifications, all of it designed to keep your brain wanting more. Do you realize that you're paying attention to your phone even when you're not paying attention to your phone? Have you ever felt your phone vibrate and then you reach into your pocket and it didn't? It's called phantom vibration syndrome, not a very creative name. But do you know what that's the result of? That's your subconscious brain paying attention to your phone even when you're not to the point where it is so hyper aware of this thing that you don't even realize that you're thinking about that it's sending off false alarms. It's that ready. Because even when you think it's not the most important thing in the room, it's the most important thing in the room to you. Guilty, by the way. Guilty of phantom vibration syndrome all the time. 
Because even when I think I'm not paying attention, I'm paying attention. It's addicting psychologically. It's addicting physiologically. And it's addicting spiritually. It's addicting spiritually. Maybe addiction is not the right word. Maybe just junk food is the right word. Or maybe just the wrong path is the right word. See, when we talk about things that are spiritual, when we talk about our spiritual life, what we're talking about is what's the most important thing? What is life all about? What is being a person all about? What is spending our day ultimately all about? Those are spiritual things. Now, I may surprise you, but there's not as much about setting up boundaries around technology in our life in the Bible as I wish there was. It would be really nice if I could turn to, to Jobs 316 and read a little bit about technology. It's not in there. But what the Bible is full of is not only uh, accounts, but testimony of what it is to connect yourself to what ultimately matters in life. To not be distracted by the things that seem good, that seem filling, that seem right, but are ultimately just distractions. There's a very interesting book in the, New, in the Old Testament called Ecclesiastes. I'm going to invite you to turn to that now if you've got a physical copy of the Bible in your hand. And if you've got a phone, you can look it up. Ecclesiastes chapter 2. And it's a very unique portion of the Bible because Ecclesiastes, the writer of Ecclesiastes, just means teacher. This is what Ecclesiastes means. And the writer isn't a prophet from God. The writer isn't a great leader of the church. The writer isn't someone who can claim divine inspiration. It's not God speaking through somebody. Ecclesiastes is the testimony of a rich man. Historically, it's been ascribed to be King Solomon. We're not sure, but either way, it'd be someone who lived like King Solomon. It's be the testimony of someone who had everything. It's the testimony of someone who chased down all of the avenues for pleasure they possibly could. That's the testimony that we're going to hear today. And the writer of Ecclesiastes, over and over throughout the text, and we're just going to read one small part, shares the conclusion they ultimately came to. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. Then we're going to skip ahead and read verses uh, 24 through 26. Hear these words. I said to myself, come, I will make you experience pleasure. Enjoy what is good. I told myself I was going to give myself pleasure and enjoyment of life. But this too was pointless. Merriment, I thought, is madness. Pleasure of no use at all. I tried cheering myself with wine and by embracing folly with wisdom still guiding me, until I might see what is really worth doing in the few days that human beings have under heaven. I took on great projects. I built houses for myself, planted vineyards for myself. I made gardens and parks for myself, planting every kind of fruit tree in them. I made reservoirs for myself to water my lush groves. I acquired male servants and female servants. I even had slaves born in my house. I had great herds of cattle and sheep, more than any who preceded me in Jerusalem. I amassed silver and gold for myself, the treasures of kings and provinces. I acquired male and female singers for myself, along with every human luxury, treasure chests galore. So I became far greater than all who preceded me in Jerusalem. Moreover, my wisdom stood by me. I refrained from nothing that my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. Indeed, my heart found pleasure from the results of my hard work. That was the reward for all my hard work. But when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had worked so hard to achieve, I realized that it was pointless. A chasing after wind, nothing is to be gained under the sun. Skipping ahead to verse 24, this is what he's learned. There's nothing better for human beings than to eat, drink, and experience pleasure in their hard work. I also saw that this is from God's hand. Who can eat and find enjoyment otherwise? Because God gives wisdom, knowledge, and joy to those who who please God. God speaks to us through the reading of Scripture. Thanks be to God. You may be wondering, that's a really interesting text to choose, right, for the Sunday of put down your phone. You know, I'll be honest, I wish there was a piece of Scripture that said, you know, disconnecteth thy group cell phone plan and resumeth a more analog lifestyle. It's not in there. But what's in that text The testimony that we have from the writer of Ecclesiastes is that I had everything. I had every form of engagement. I had every form of entertainment. I had every form of distracting myself that I could possibly want. And ultimately, I realized it mattered for nothing. Ultimately, I realized that the goodness of life is not found in entertaining oneself to death or consuming oneself to death to make yourself feel better. But instead, it's about real connection with real people. In real work that makes a real difference. 
That's what actually matters. Spiritually, you need to put down your phone. You need to put down your phone. It's useful for a whole bunch of things up to a point. And then this point crosses over where you become addicted to the feedback loop of the likes or the responses. Put down your phone. At some point, you become addicted to the news. News curated, by the way, by websites or apps to help you, you know, feel reinforced of what you already believe. You become addicted to that constant dopamine release of being reinforced of what you already think. You need to put down your phone. You become addicted to the sense of validation that comes from people needing you at all hours and you feeling like you're always on top of the ball because you always get back to them so quick. You become addicted to it. You need to put down your phone. You growing spiritually realizes that what really matters at the end of the day is your connection to God and each other and you are not connecting to God or anybody else when there is a phone in your hand. Even worse, you're creating distance between yourself and the other people in the room with you. You are. So here's what I need you to do. We have a challenge this week. You need to take some steps. The first step is you need to take a couple steps of disconnecting yourself from that device. <laughs> it's ironic, but I would encourage you to Google suggestions on how to do that. The things that I found that work best for me, not sleeping in the same room with the phone, turning off notifications on the phone. When I'm home, off work, after six o'clock, not checking the phone, setting the phone to grayscale so that it's not uh, as visually engaging or addicting, removing all the time-killing apps off the phone. All of those are excellent pieces of advice. Even doing things like disconnecting uh, the email app on your phone from your work email so you have to take those extra steps to log in, stopping you from doing it habitually when it's not necessary. Whatever it is that finds you going back to your phone to the point where it's no longer useful, but is actually you just distracting yourself from your living life, take a step this week to move away from that. All of us need to do that. I'm talking to the mirror right here. And the second thing that you need to do, the second thing that I'm asking you to do, the second thing that is very important for you to do for the purpose of your own spiritual growth is what actually makes you feel alive? What's not the saccharine, high sugar, not really feeling thing that you're getting for your phone, but you should be getting somewhere else, right? The connection, the engagement, the relationship with other people. What is it that makes you feel alive? Is it spending time with your kids? Then I want you to today plan something special with your kids. Is it meeting up with friends for dinner? Then I want you to today make plans with someone else. Is it spending time outdoors, going for a walk, enjoying the weather? Then make a plan today for some time this week to step away from that digital facsimile of life and engagement and to actually live a little bit more in order to grow spiritually now, in order to grow spiritually this week, in order to continue to grow into the life that God has created for you, you, me, and everyone else today. Let's put down the phone because real life is waiting for us. It is so, so, so much better. These phones are miracles. They make so many incredible things happen. They make connections that weren't otherwise possible possible. They've streamlined our lives in so many ways. But they're also a distraction. They're also a source of disconnection. They're also a source of disengagement this week. Let's put down our phones and engage with the life that God made for us now. Amen? Let's pray. Great and loving God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, so many incredibly gifted people have blessed our lives with incredible technologies that have shrunk the world, that have allowed us to remain connected to the people we love the most, to help us connect, engage with new people that have provided us with life-saving access to information and communication. And at the same time, we can become addicted psychologically, physiologically, even spiritually to these devices. God, help us not miss the life that we are living staring at the palms of our hands, and let us this week live more deeply in relationship with each other, with our families, and with you, our God.
And it's the name and following the example of your son, Jesus the Christ, that we together pray the words that he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.